and welcome to High School Physics Explained. And today I would like to talk briefly about a simple explanation as to why a magnet levitates on top of a super magnet, commonly referred to as the Meissner effect. And if you've seen my previous video, I basically demonstrated the Meissner effect. The superconducting material expels all the magnetic field lines that are trying to penetrate it. And so here I have a diagram that represents a little bit like that. So the diagram here on the left shows you a material that allows magnetic field lines to penetrate it. But if that material is a superconductive material, the temperature it drops below its critical temperature, then the magnetic field lines are going around it. In other words, they're expelled. And that is what the Meissner effect is. But let's now talk about a brief and simplistic explanation as to why the Meissner effect causes the magnet to levitate. Now, I will say a little caveat here is that the Meissner effect is actually a result of some quantum phenomena. So there is a lot more to this situation than the explanation that I'm about to give you. But if you're a high school student, this is all that's required. And so therefore, you don't need a degree in quantum mechanics to understand it. So here I have my magnet. And of course, it sits on top of my superconductor material. And of course, the magnetic field lines are in that arrangement. Now, if I place my magnet on top of the superconducting disk, these magnetic field lines from the superconductor penetrate the actual superconducting disk. This is, of course, as long as the material is above its critical temperature. But when this material go below its critical temperature, these magnetic field lines don't penetrate it. In other words, they simply disappear like this. But what we note, of course, is that this magnet starts to levitate. Now, what's going on? So here is my magnet, and I'm going to hold the magnet initially above our superconducting disk so that I can draw on this diagram to show you what happens. But of course, all the things that I'm about to describe actually occur while the magnet is sitting on top of the disk. And you're more aware, of course, is that this magnet has a magnetic field. And of course, that magnetic field goes around like so. But what happens in the superconducting disk as the temperature drops below the critical temperature? Well, the thing that happens is, is that as it be drops below the critical temperature, it starts to produce a little eddy current. Electrons start to flow. And they themselves will flow in such a way that they will produce a magnetic field that mirror images the magnetic field that is above it. In effect, within the material, it cancels out the magnetic field lines. Hence, the magnetic field lines are expelled. That means we produce a south pole over here and a north pole below. Now, because I'm producing a south pole on top of the surface due to this little eddy current forming here that repels the south pole that is above it. And so now what we're getting is a repulsion going on between the magnet and the superconducting disk. Of course, that force will weaken as it goes up. And because we still have the gravitational force acting downwards, it comes to a point where there is some equilibrium. If I were to demonstrate it in this example, again, I would produce a small eddy current over here and a small eddy current over here. Again, those little eddy currents will produce magnetic fields that are mirror images of the ones that are trying to penetrate it. And so therefore they in effect cancel out the magnetic fields here. And that means the direction of that current is in that direction on that side its directional on that side, that produces a small north pole over on the top here and a small south pole on the top over here. And again, like my previous example, that means we now get a repulsive force between the two. In both cases, what we're getting again is small eddy currents that will produce magnetic fields that are mirror images of the ones that are trying to penetrate it. In essence, you're cancelling out those magnetic field lines, and therefore you have no magnetic field lines within the material. And again, I want to reiterate is that I'm not going to the explanation as to why those electrons actually start to move. 
that is a much more difficult concept and is explained using quantum mechanics, or it's often referred to as a quantum mechanical effect. But needless to say, that explains why the magnet actually starts to levitate, whether it is orientated in this situation or whether it is orientated in this situation. It's a balance between the repulsive forces over here and, of course, the gravitational force affecting it. Now, that's a very simplistic way of explaining it. However, there's a couple of things that make it a little bit more complicated. If you've ever tried to play with a magnet and try to levitate it above another magnet, you know how very difficult it is for that magnet to stay above the magnet that you have. In other words, it simply falls off to the side. And yet, if you play around with this situation, if you and uh, you have a small magnet sitting above a superconducting disk, you'll notice that if you push it, it is relatively stable. It stays in the center. Why is this? Well, let me first of all explain that life isn't so simple. Now, you remember this diagram, and I told you that this two materials represents a superconductor, whether it's above the critical temperature or whether it is below the critical temperature. But this diagram actually also demonstrates type 1 superconductors and type 2 superconductors. Now, that seems to be a contradiction to what I stated before, but let me explain a little bit further. Types of 1 superconductors are generally your metals, and those materials become superconductors under weak magnetic fields. But place strong magnetic fields on them, they tend to break down, so therefore they stop becoming superconductor materials. Type 2 superconductors, which are usually complex ceramics, they actually are able to maintain their superconductive state at much higher magnetic fields that are exposed to them. But unlike type 1, where the magnetic fields are definitely excluded from the material when they go below their critical temperature, with type 2, we do have some penetration of magnetic field lines. And I say some, and what it actually produces is that some magnetic field lines pass through the material, and we have regions outside with that are referred to as vortices, where the material is in a superconductor state. Now, again, I'm not going to go into the deep physics of it, but what that helps us understand is the stability. Now, when Meissner effect is demonstrated in the classroom, we use a material that is made up of yttrium, barium, copper, and oxygen, with their numbers here. Now, this particular ceramic is a type 2 superconductor. And one of the interesting about the type 2 semiconductor is, is that its critical temperature is 93 Kelvin. And that temperature is above the temperature of liquid nitrogen's boiling point, which means you're able to cool this below its critical temperature. What happens here is that we have some partial magnetic field lines penetrating material, which leads to a phenomena called flux pinning. And that is the explanation as to why this magnet can remain fairly stable. For a high school student, the understanding of flux spinning is certainly not necessary. As I stated before, a quantum mechanics degree would help you there. But needless to say, life is a little bit more complex than the simplistic explanation often given in textbooks. In any case, I hope that has given you a I hope that has helped you understand the Meissner effect a little bit better. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.